Welcome to another virtual biology lecture. Today we're going to be discussing evolution. Hope you guys enjoy and don't forget to take good notes. Today's virtual lecture's objective is to become familiar with the following assessment standards from reporting category 3 that are going to be tested in the STAR Biology ELC. Now at the end of the lecture you should be able to explain the theory of evolution by natural selection as well as evidence of common ancestry such as that found in the fossil record, biogeography, homologies, etc. Today's lecture is going to be focusing a great deal on the theory of evolution, but before we begin, there are two main terms that you must be familiar with. The first word is theory, which is basically a well-supported, testable explanation to a certain phenomenon. Now, the second word is evolution, which is basically change over time. For instance, if we looked at change that iPhones had over a period of time, we would see how they've been modified over the years. However, Evolution is not seen in a short amount of time. It's actually seen over a long period of time. For instance, if we were to look back at the first cell phones that were developed and compare them to the descendants and eventually the most modern iPhone, we would truly see how cell phones have evolved a great deal. Okay, so now let's combine these two words and their definitions, which results in a definition for the theory of evolution, which is a well-supported, testable explanation of the process in which organisms change over a long period of time. Now, the theory of evolution is greatly associated with Charles Darwin's observations, as well as those of other scientists such as Bonnet, Lamarck, Malthus, and many others. Bonnet, for instance, while studying fossils, developed a hypothesis which stated that the Earth was subjected to periodic catastrophes that affected the entire planet by killing all living things. He believed that fossils were the remains of those now dead life forms. He also believed that following each catastrophe, new life forms would emerge, and that all of these new life forms were slight improvements of earlier life forms, which were the result of evolution. Later, Lamarck proposed a new theory of evolution, in which he believed that organisms evolved by acquiring characteristics during their entire lifetimes and then passing those new beneficial traits onto their offspring. He believed that organisms would change due to the demands of their environment and used giraffes as actual prime examples. Now, he believed that the neck of a giraffe became longer during its lifetime because it had to stretch its neck to reach leaves on high branches. He also thought that the giraffes that developed the longer necks during their lifetimes actually passed those acquired traits of a longer neck to their offspring. The offspring in turn stretched and developed even longer necks. As a result, over many generations, all giraffes acquired long necks. Overall, his basic idea that organisms evolved was accepted, but how they evolved was not widely accepted and later actually disproven. Malthus was another brilliant mind whose work greatly influenced Darwin's. He identified that populations eventually outgrow their food resources, which leads to competition for food. Okay, so this brings us to Charles Darwin's work, which took place on a five-year scientific voyage on the British ship called the HMS Beagle, in which he visited many continents and islands. He made many observations and collected evidence that led him to develop his theory of evolution. After Darwin returned to England in 1836, he had notebooks filled of ideas about evolution. However, he didn't believe that the scientific community was ready to hear his findings, so he didn't immediately publish his ideas. Instead, he waited till he found another scientific mind by the name of Alfred Russell Wallace in 1858 that also shared many of the same ideas. One year later, Darwin published his book on the origin of species, which presented evidence of evolution and the driving force of evolution, which he called natural selection. For instance, he believed that long-necked giraffes are randomly born and that they have more offspring due to their competitive advantage. Okay, so what exactly was this theory of his? Well, basically Darwin realized in his travels several key components of evolution, which he referred to as conditions. First of all, he noticed that genetic variation is found naturally in all populations. He also noticed that some organisms in a population are less likely to survive because there's a struggle for existence, in other words, competition, 
which means that members of each species must compete for food, space, and other resources. Now, those organisms that are better adapted to their environment would have a higher chance of survival. This often is referred to as survival of the fittest. Those organisms that are better adapted to their environment would have a higher chance of survival. This is often referred to as survival of the fittest, which meant that only organisms which are better adapted to the environment have a greater likelihood of surviving into adulthood and passing those traits onto their offspring. Now, Darwin believed that over time, natural selection results from changes in the inherited characteristics of population, which increases a species fitness in its environment. Okay, so let's recap some key terms that you need to understand. First, the term fitness, which is basically the ability of an individual to survive and reproduce in its specific environment. Now, the word adaptation is basically any traits, either behavioral or physical, that improve an organism's chances of survival and reproduction in its environment. For example, birds' beaks come in all shapes and sizes. Now, this is a physical adaptation because the shape of the bird's beak plays a role in the types of food that that bird can eat. Other adaptations include such things as color, the presence of spines, and behaviors such as migration. Now, organisms in a species have different traits. We call these traits or differences variations. Variations may result from mutations or from how genetic material is rearranged during sexual reproduction. Many adaptations are under genetic control. Individuals with these favorable inheritable traits tend to survive and reproduce, passing the adaptations on to their offspring. Now, through these changes, a population may evolve into a new species. Okay, so here's another key term that you must understand. Species, which is a group of organisms that share similar characteristics and can interbreed to produce fertile offspring. Now, all members of a species that live in an area at the same time make up a population. Over time, variations that arise within a population because of a mutation or natural selection can have two major outcomes, speciation or extinction. Now, speciation is the evolution of new species from an existing species. One species can evolve into another if the environment changes. One species can evolve into another if the environment changes. For example, if the environment becomes colder, animals with thicker fur would be better able to survive, reproduce, and pass this trait on to their offspring. Overall, natural selection is the idea that organisms with favorable variations for the environment survive, reproduce, and pass those variations on to the next generation. Natural selection drives speciation and increases species diversity. Now, Darwin believed that evolution is descent with modification, which basically means that each species has descended with changes from other species over time. This idea suggests that all living species are related to each other and that all species, living and extinct, share a common ancestor. First, let's start by identifying what a fossil is. Fossils are the remains of organisms found within rock layers which are arranged in order from the oldest at the bottom which means fossils found in these layers can be dated as well because they are thought to be the same age as the rock layer that they are found in. Basically, the layers of the rock tell the history of the earth while the fossils found within the rock tell the history of life which provides us with a fossil record which is a basic series of changes that occur over time. Scientists have found some transition fossils which show the changes as one species evolves into another. One group of organisms for which transition fossils are known is whales. Modern whales live in the ocean and are shaped like fish. The history goes back to a group of hoofed mammals that lived on land. Fossil evidence indicates that the distant ancestors of whales walked on land and could also swim. Later, fossils suggest that over time, the hind limbs of the whale ancestors shrank. Their forelimbs became modified into flippers, and then their hind limbs evolved into a powerful tail-like structure called a fluke. The illustration shows one possible sequence of stages in the evolution of modern whales. 
Another source of evidence is found in geographic distribution of Earth's organisms, also known as biogeography. Now, biogeography is a combination of data regarding both living organisms as well as fossils in order to identify where different species have lived at different moments in time. Okay, so let's try to think back when we first learned about Earth's continents being joined together as a single large landmass called Pangaea. Well, when this landmass split apart, the continents moved to their present locations through the process known as continental drift. Now, the fossil record shows that in addition of changing Earth's surface, continental drift also changed the distribution of Earth's organisms as well. For instance, fossils of a reptile called Mesosaurus actually provide great evidence of how continental drift changed the distribution of Earth's organisms. Now, this reptile lived more than 250 million years ago, and scientists have found fossils of it in both South America and Africa. Now, it's important to note that this organism did not live in the ocean. It actually lived in freshwater lakes, ponds, and rivers. So how is it then that this organism came to live in two such distant locations? Well, scientists have concluded that the Mesosaurus lived in South America and Africa when these two continents were connected. And as the continents separated, they actually carried the descendants of Mesosaurus to distant locations. Now, geographic distribution also tells us about the type of evolution that may be experienced among different species. For instance, whales and sharks have a similar body design, even though they are very different organisms. I mean, one is a fish and the other is a mammal. But because they have independently adapted to living in a similar environment, we consider this as an example of convergent evolution. Now, if we were to look at a more closely related species to whales, such as wolves, who are also mammals, but don't look or act like them, well, this would actually be an example of divergent evolution. Overall, divergent evolution illustrates homologous structures between closely related species who do not look or act alike. Now, convergent evolution, on the other hand, this creates analogous structures that have similar form or function, but are not present in the last common ancestor of those groups. Okay, so let's take a closer look at these types of structures, which brings us to our next evidence of common ancestry, which is anatomical homologies, which is sometimes referred to as comparative anatomy. Homologies, which are defined as the state of having the same or similar relation or structure. Now, scientists often study the physical features and anatomical structures of organisms to try to discover how organisms are related to one another. Now, homologous structures are body parts of different organisms that have a similar structure but have different functions. For example, the human arm, a bird's wing, a whale's flipper, etc. are all homologous structures. Although each body part is used differently, they are composed of similar bones. Now, homologous structures indicate that organisms share a common ancestor that had a similar structure, which is often seen among species that have experienced divergent evolution from each other. However, as we previously mentioned, convergent evolution leads to distantly related species to have analogous structures which are body parts that have similar function but not made up the same way. For instance, the wing of a butterfly and the wing of a bird both have the same function, which is to fly, but the structures are not made up the same way. Overall, homologous structures may look very different on the outside, but they are made from the same bones. Because they are made from the same clump of undifferentiated cells in the embryo, this tells us that they share a common ancestry. Now, when comparing anatomy to look for shared ancestry, scientists also examine vestigial structures, which are body parts that do not seem to play a major role in an organism's life functions. Now, rats, for instance, they have an appendix that is part of their digestive system. Humans also have an appendix. However, its function is unclear and it's not essential for survival, which is why it's considered a vestigial structure. Now, the presence of an appendix in both rats and humans suggests that the common ancestor of these species also had an appendix. Now, there are other types of homology seen as evidence of common ancestry, such as developmental homologies, also referred to as embryology, and molecular homologies, which... Embryology is the study of embryo development. Now, scientists have realized that embryos of different vertebrates look alike in early stages, giving the superficial appearance of a relationship. 
Basically, early development is the same for many organisms, which is strong evidence of common ancestry. When looking at the embryos of many animals with backbones, there are a lot of similarities which suggest that the same groups of undifferentiated cells developed in the same order to produce the same tissues and organs of all vertebrates, suggesting that they evolved from a common ancestor. Genetic diversity provides the raw material for evolution. Scientists have developed techniques for identifying evolutionary relationships among species. For example, comparisons of sequences of nucleotides in DNA and the amino acids in certain proteins can be used to show common ancestry. The more similarities between two DNA sequences or two amino acid sequences, the more closely related the organisms are. Similar karyotypes suggest an evolutionary relationship. Okay, so now that we understand the different forms of evidence of common ancestry, now let's talk about how genetic variation, which leads to evolution, can arise in different ways. Basically, there are factors also known as driving forces that cause allele frequencies to change. For instance, mutations, gene flow, genetic drift, and natural selection are all known as forces of evolution. Let's first recap on what we know about mutations. Remember that a mutation is a change in a DNA sequence, and most mutations are caused by errors during DNA replication or by damage to DNA from chemicals or radiation. Now, to affect evolution, mutations must be passed on from one generation to the next. Now remember, only mutations that happen in gametes can actually be passed on to the offspring, so only those have the potential to affect evolution. It's important to note that mutations can either have a beneficial or a negative effect to the organism's fitness. Now, another cause of genetic variation is gene flow, which is the introduction of genes from one population into the gene pool of another population. Now, a gene pool is the combined genetic information of all members of the population. Now, there's several factors that affect gene flow. The most significant factor is actually mobility or movement of individuals into different populations. For example, because animals can move and plants cannot, they tend to have a higher rate of gene flow. Now, genetic drift is a random change in allele frequencies that occurs in a small population under two special conditions. The first is the bottleneck effect, which occurs when a population suddenly gets much smaller, and this happens when, let's say, a natural disaster takes place, such as a forest fire, or etc., and by chance, allele frequencies of the survivors may be different from those of the original population. Now, the founder effect, on the other hand, occurs when a few individuals start or found a new population. By chance, allele frequencies of the founders may be different from allele frequencies of the population they left. Okay, now let's take a look at natural selection in action, in which, as we mentioned before, genetic variation exists within populations, which is why not all animals among a population will look the same. We also know that these individuals within a population will compete for limited resources. Well, because not all individuals will be able to survive, they tend to produce more offspring than what will actually survive. So, which individuals within a population will survive? Well, individuals among a population with the most beneficial traits or variations that are suitable for the environment will actually be the ones that survive and reproduce. It's important for you to understand that natural selection acts on populations, not individuals. The population is affected when the genetic variations that lead to helpful traits increase an organism's fitness thus giving a higher percentage of these individuals among the population due to higher survival rates. Now, let's take a look at peppered moths as an example. Pe pepper moths are active at night and during the day rest on trees. Now, as you can imagine, some of these resting moths are actually eaten by birds. Now, which form of peppered moth do you think will have a higher mortality rate, in other words, death rate, in unpolluted forest areas where the tree trunks and branches are lighter? Well, the black peppered moth, because it's going to be easier to spot by the predators. Okay, so what about forest areas where air pollution has resulted in dark tree trunks and branches? Well, the speckled moth, because now that's going to be easier to spot and the black peppered moths will blend into the trees. Specifically, this difference results from different alleles of a single gene. The allele for the black form is dominant over the allele for the speckled form. 
but based on environmental factors, a population of pepper moths may be subjected to natural selection due to a higher survival rate of one over the other, based on who will fit or adapt to their environment the best. As we mentioned previously, some genetic variations may be due to mutations which can actually lead to natural selection. For example, organisms can develop pesticide and antibiotic resistance. Basically, they develop the ability to withstand those harmful agents that once killed them. Now, people use chemicals called pesticides to kill organisms that destroy crops or spread diseases. Often, some insects in a population have slight variations that enable them to survive the pesticide. These insects can pass the trait down to the next generation, which would cause them to all be pesticide resistant. For instance, the number of cases of malaria around the world has increased dramatically due to the increase in infected mosquitoes that cause malaria that are now pesticide resistant. Now, because of natural selection, the number of resistant organisms is likely to continue to increase if people keep using these pesticides. Another example is bacteria developing antibiotic resistance. In other words, the medicine known as an antibiotic, which normally killed the bacteria or slowed their growth, no longer affects that bacteria. Basically, some bacteria in a population may have a trait that makes them resistant to an antibiotic. And over time, those that are not resistant are killed off, and those that are resistant are allowed to make another generation of bacteria. But now, this new batch of bacteria is resistant to that antibiotic. Keep in mind that genetic variations among a population can also be controlled by humans through artificial selection. Basically, humans select certain traits among organisms that they find the most useful, such as selecting and breeding cows that will produce more milk or have the most meat. Now, as mentioned before, genetic variations that arise within a population due to any of these forces of evolution may have two major outcomes. They can either go through speciation, which is the creation or the development of a new species from a pre-existing species, or they can go through extinction. We discussed what speciation is. So what is extinction? Well, when species cannot adapt to a changing environment, they may actually end up dying out or becoming extinct completely. Now, extinction is the permanent loss of a species. Some extinctions result from quick, drastic changes in an environment, such as a volcanic eruption or flood that kills all of the members of a population. However, mass extinctions will actually help increase Earth's biodiversity because the extinction of many species at the same time make it possible for new species to evolve and thrive. For instance, the extinction of the dinosaurs allowed other land animals to flourish and diversify, especially the mammals, which became more diverse after the extinction of the dinosaurs. Over the course of Earth's history, a wide variety of life forms have appeared, ranging from unicellular to multicellular organisms. By studying fossils, DNA sequences, and other evidence, scientists have developed ideas about ancestral relationships and the rates at which different species of organisms evolve. Now, with these pieces of information, scientists have developed phylogenetic trees, also known as evolutionary trees. And these show the evolutionary relationships among various biological species based upon similarities and differences in their physical or genetic characteristics. Overall, Darwin's theory of evolution provides us with an explanation for the process of species to change over time, suggesting the idea of common ancestry. Now, you should also note that Darwin believed that natural selection was the driving force of evolution. Okay, now that we've gone over the theory of evolution by natural selection and other evolutionary mechanisms, you should be familiar with the following assessment standards from reporting category 3. This concludes our virtual biology lecture on evolution. I hope that you all took great notes and wrote down any questions or concerns that you may have regarding this topic so that we can discuss in class. Well, that's it. Have a great one. It's